Good evening, and welcome once again to Plain Talk Election Special. As we all know by now, the polls for the general and regional elections will open on 6 a.m. Monday, May 11th. That gives us roughly nine hours, 45 minutes, and four days. No doubt, the contesting parties, and let's face it, there are two major players in these elections. In fact, they've been described as a two-horse race. I wouldn't want to go so far because, of course, there are regional elections as well. But the preparations are already well advanced. The campaigns are moving into the final stages of their rallies. They're probably also simultaneously into house to house campaigning, the bottom house rumors, um, innuendos, allegations, etc. no doubt in place. But for us, we have a duty to try to make some sense out of what sometimes appears to be nonsense, to be um, lawlessness, to be breaches of the elections code, breaches of the election laws. This evening, instead of two guests in two segments, I have a single guest, and we will be going for one hour straight. It is rather very disappointing how many people still are afraid to come on television and to answer questions which we as citizens ought to be able to answer without fear of offending someone or the other. Let me immediately welcome my guest. He's a person I think many people wonder, does this person really exist? He's a regular letter writer, um, has a very, very strong tip on his pen, and he is none other than G.H.K. Lal, which is very different, I must say, from Glenn Lal. Mr. G.H.K., welcome to Plato. Thank you, Mr. Ram. As a writer and a commentator and an observer, you no doubt have been monitoring the elections campaign. It really began in earnest after nomination day. How would you describe the tone of this campaign? There are two tones which have been pretty distinct. One tone has been appalling and deplorable. We'll get to that in a moment. The good part, I have not heard the leader of the opposition, the joint opposition, Brigadier Retired Granger, say anything that comes close to being impolite, to being unacceptable, to being royally. Him and his group have been able to be disciplined and focused about their message, about what they're, they represent as a group. On the other hand, on the other hand, the PPP has, had, has known no bounds. It was not satisfied with the people it had on the ground. It went and brought back, resurrected, exhumed Mr. Jack Dale. And he did not disappoint. As a matter of fact, he made us cringe. He made even PP people in the PPP, honest, decent people, cringe. I think that's why we're not hearing from him anymore in the past few days. It has really been a descent into the gutter. Why, uh, in your view, uh, and, and first of all, I should ask you, is that statement, is that a generalization of the PPP? Is there, 
are there redeemable features, redeemable personalities in the PPP and their campaign? Uh, look, at this point, the PPP, the people in the PPP who are so-called moderates, who should have been the voice of calm, the voice of reasoning, they have been immersed. They have been overwhelmed by circumstances, by personalities that are stronger than them. I feel at one time several years ago, maybe several elections ago, they might have been redeemable. This is not about rehabilitation of the PPP. This is about a group that is desperate to stay in power at all costs and will pull out all the stops. And that is what we have seen. So redeemable is out the door. So um, they, they pull out all the stops, the um, irredeemable. The, the tone of the campaign, you, 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 which your usual um, flair for words, you've described it um, in very graphic terms. Why, in your view, is the campaign spearheaded by Jack Dio so vicious? We got a saying in Guyana when Cora got slaughterhouse, in a cave where you do something, I think the former Minister of Health can fill in the missing word. That's something that the cow does on the slaughterhouse floor. I think that's where the ruling party is currently, and it knows it. Therefore, there is this wide strain, this broad element of desperation that convulses its efforts. And that is why it had to go back to Mr. Jack Dale, because some people were not prepared to go to those lengths. But is it logical that if you see um, something, a problem steering you, don't you try to avert it? Um, or is that part of the psych psyche and the psychology that you, you, you become more desperate? Well, one, you become more desperate. The other thing, the, the logic has gone out the window a long time ago. This is a group that listens to nobody, pays attention to nobody, dismisses everybody, including, including the reasonable, rational voices within, is just bent on being who it is. And Mr. Jack Dew is the best man to be to carry them to the, in that direction. Best in the worst. In the worst case scenario. Now, if all of these things are true, um, and I'm not challenging the, the veracity of what you're saying, why are the authorities so silent? We've got race hate legislation, hate speech legislation. We've got the representation of the People's Act, as you know. It proscribes certain kind of behavior. Um, I, I saw outside of Freedom House, they've practically com commandeered all the, 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 the flanks of the, the streets. They, today we see that they're painting the vote PPP on the streets when only traffic signs are permitted to be painted. Why are the authorities so silent in trying to say to the PPP, to say to Mr. Jagdeo, look, and take whatever action is necessary, this is a violation of the law, it's a violation of the norms of good behavior, it is leading us to destruction. Why is nobody doing anything? The short answer is best encapsulated in one word, fear. Fear, let's go further, self-protection, self-preservation. The authorities are there. I think they have been cowed for a long time because what we have had is one atrocity after another, whether it's in the judiciary, whether it's in the police, whether it's corruption, whether it's nicil disclosure, as you know. So this is just part of the continuum that we will get away, we will push the envelope, and we will get away, and we do get away. So the authorities find themselves powerless and on the retreat in the face of this concerted onslaught that has been going on for several years now. Give me your background, and you yourself have written on corruption, I, I think it was, what's the name of the book, uh, in which you used as a tagline yeah. cesspool? Guyana, a national cesspool of greed, duplicity, and corruption, a remigrant story. 
Now, is our state resources being abused in in this election campaign? And and I ask you that question, and I'm going to say this a little bit careful. Does it mean that we cannot have fair elections? Well, let me say this: the, the by itself, the PPP has got cannot be matched in terms of resources, money, manpower, and the know-how that is accumulated over the years. That's on the one side. Has it utilized or misutilized state resources? No, no question about that. And again, has there have there been voices that have said, look, this is wrong, this is abusive. Yes, there have been, but they've all been dismissed and neglected in the process. So the, the, the train just keeps on rolling. We were having this conversation before, and I told you how, how difficult it is. Um, my experience, which is why I don't think I'll continue this program, just getting people to come and talk. Well, it's so difficult. Let me interrupt you. I was doing a church program a couple of weeks ago. I went to 20 people in and out of my church. Minimum of 20 people. What type of program? Church program for television? For television. Um, elections in Guyana, a time of challenge for Christians and for society. I had to go through almost 2,000 people to get four or five persons for the panel. So I shouldn't feel too bad. You shouldn't feel too badly. You know the story of the list. I think you've written about it. So have I. So have a number of people. What appears to be an extremely bloated list. Um, this is not necessary. This is not um, to suggest is the fall. For the fault of GCOM. Is there a risk of these elections being compromised? Yes, sir. Because of that list? Yes, sir. The, the, I mean, you go from 2011 in a, in a span of three, let's call it four years, and you've gone to just under 100,000 new arrivals, new voting arrivals. I mean, that's 25% increase almost, give or take. Mm -hmm. In three years, because in, it was in, November 28th when yes. the last election. So, so, so I, I mean, the opportunity and uh, numbers, given our small numbers, for mischief is, is definitely there. How did we get to that bloated number so quickly? What, what are the ingredients in there? And I've seen some of GCOM's public explanations on the thing and, and some of it has some explanations or hypothetical because, possibilities yeah. Yeah. And, and because I, we don't have actual data we don't have actual data and, and, and I think it touches upon what could be part of the thing but more questions and answers as you know um, these elections are going to be heavily observed the Carter Center after 23 years is returning to Ghana. Um, it's probably the most prominent election observer group. The Commonwealth Secretariat observer group, the um, OSX observer group, I think CARICOM. Plus you have, of course, GCOM, an independent body. You have, um, I, I guess, the political parties themselves. And those reasonably could protection and buffers against any electoral improprieties on the day? I'm asking myself why is it that you specify just on the day, but here's the story. Do you see international observers, and you've been here longer than me, you've been in, embedded in these things to some extent. Do you see international observers at the isolated polling stations, at the bottom house, the residential polling stations, being there all day, being there on a continuous basis. I think those windows, when Vincent Alexander stepped away from GCOM, maybe this is a little touchy thing, 
we've heard, we've heard all kinds of things, including from Mr. Alexander himself, of what went on during the counting process. The algorithms went crazy or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen with all these thousands of polling stations outside, the, the polling stations outside of the mainstream? Mm -hmm. So I'm saying to you the opportunity for mischief is there. And because when you couple that, or when you attach the desperation, and the very visible and public desperation as exhibited by one party, I would say, why not? But, and I would say, how not? Well, um, as you know, there are there are officials, but uh, it, it's it's your answer. I ask the questions, you mm -hmm. you give the answer. Um, the the question then is, um, I, I, and and you suggested what my emphasis on the day, because my view about these elections is that if the playing field is not level you can't it's a contradiction to suggest that it can be fair if the playing field is not level and the playing field cannot be level when state resources the state media are appropriated for the benefit of one set of players can is, is that by definition unfair? Well, you're starting out. The, the opposition is starting out way behind at a tremendous disadvantage. Its message is stifled or suppressed totally. It does not have equal access. It does not have free access. It does not have independent in, in, the, people's, in the people's media. So uh, to, talk, to talk about fear from the get-go Contradiction in terms or uh, over -exagger exaggeration? I would say definitely. You have been a prolific contributor to the letter columns of the newspapers. Um, no doubt these are issues that have jarred you and prompted you to write, you decide, look, I can't take this anymore. Let me pick up my pen and write. What is your assessment uh, overall, taking all the writings that you have done, your assessment of the PPP's record in office in the 10th parliament, which is from November 2011 to, well, up to now, because all of parliament is prorogued the government remains in place. Again, in one word, despicable, unacceptable. You are the government. It is incumbent upon you, it is imperative that the government finds ways not to talk about consensus, but arrive at consensus, at compromise, to find we, we talk about local government, we talk about anti-money laundering, the thorny issues that tore us apart. And yet it was this adamantine stance that this is where you are, this is where we are, and the two shall not meet. There was no attempt, as, as I can tell, from my own review of, of, of things, and the nature and the characteristic of the ruling party to really get things done or to meet people, the other side, the opposition, halfway. Look, let, let, let me go further. Let's go beyond the 10th parliament. Let's be utterly candid here. As an Indian, as a Guyanese, as a remigrant, my pen does not have enough words to state how I feel. What happens to the poor man out there what happens to the man who cannot feed his family three meals a day? What happens to the man who's struggling and the woman, the single parent? How do they feel about this so-called glorious track record, these esteemed leaders, these grand masters? This is what this is all about. Uh, uh, again, I come back though, Mr. Lal. Are there persons on the side of the government who would have stood out for the good? Well, where are they? I'm asking you. Well, I, I'm saying 
If they have, they have stood out silently. If they have, they have stood out in absentia. If they, I'm not saying the entire, let's be straight here, that the entire group is doomed, is devilish. What I'm saying, that the few voices, the few sane voices that could have represented some semblance of civility, of progress, of patriotism, allow themselves to be intimidated, to be bullied, and to be silenced. And as such, the lunatics took over the asylum. Um, I'm going to pass on that analogy and ask you, who set out, um, as you said, the good ones were probably silent, who set out in a negative sense among the ministers and the members of parliament? We have the Minister of Finance. I thought as a Guyana scholar, I thought as a highly qualified man, he should have been very voluble, he should have been very forceful in the field of truth, in the field of disclosure, in the field of what is right. He is one voice I really expected to be out there leading the charge. I also expected Dr. Frank Anthony to, to take a stand. I, Go on. And I'm thinking about other names that and, and, and I'm running so, short. So these are people who have disappointed you. But who, are the, who are the egregious ones, if you had to? The president himself. But then again, the president is first and foremost a party animal. The party comes first. So everything else is a way second, third, fourth. The president is a disappointment. He shouldn't have been there in the first place. The Minister of Education. I really believe that the Minister of Education could I have... And you yourself are, are an educationist, even in a part-time way, is that correct? Yes, sir. Part-time volunteer basis. I expected that the Minister of Education would have been exemplary in taking a stand, not just for women's rights, when a minister crosses the line, but for people's rights, for the country's rights, for for society to set an example for the children in terms of conduct, in terms of this is what I stand for. Somebody should have resigned. A number of people should have resigned in protest and say, we're out of in here. In protest at what? Uh, of, of the direction that the party took in the standards that the party came to represent, in the way that the party was viewed by regular society out there, including supporters including supporters. You know the president um, had calls for the firing of number of ministers, including the Minister of Legal Affairs and Attorney General, Mr. Nandalal. Um, he had called for the Minister of Health to resign. And in fact, he did take action against the Minister of Health. I believe it's an act of convenience. I believe that the president's hand was forced. He took an interminably long time to arrive at that place. Starbrook News said the minister was fired. I don't think they have it quite absolutely. He was relieved, right. of, he his was relieved of his duties, which leaves room for further developments in an improved way, in a return. So I think here again the, the president was edging. So that act, that act is circumscribed by what he is in his mind in terms that if we win, you're coming back. Or worst case scenario, look, you can't come back, but here's this plum for you. So the man is not really fired. Is, is not taking an unduly pessimistic view, an unkind, an uncharitable view of the action of, by the minister, by the president? Well, look, the president has not instilled any confidence in me in terms of what he stands for. What does this president stand for? Mr. Ram, what does this president stand for? He is there, and yet he's not there. I get the impression he's a figurehead. 
This is a man who should be leading the charge. Here is an election. He is supposed to be the presidential candidate for his party. And he's taking not a back seat, but a back aisle. He's allowed the process to be hijacked. He's allowed himself to be sidelined. So here it is, you're telling me, sir, that he took action. He did not take action in a forthright manner. He did not take action in a conclusive manner. He, he just waffled, which is characteristic of his leadership. And I think that is being very kind to him. The elections in Ghana are always accompanied by a manifesto from each of the parties setting out what they propose doing um, and, and promises, pledges maybe um, they make to the electorate. Do, ma do manifestos matter? Political manifestos are love letters. They are love letters about we we'll love each other, I will love you forever, I will continue to love you through thick and thin, I'll be there for you, and at the end of the day, if I still keep everything for myself, please love me too. That's what political manifestos are in general terms. This is no different. But yet there's a difference between the two manifestos that I've seen after I, I agreed to share in this program. They are very specific things, and they're areas which are promised. But I have a problem with the manifesto on the part of the ruling PPP, and I'll tell you where. Vision 2020, and I hope I'm not preempting you. Go, go on, you go on. The first line says, a united country, a united country. Is somebody kidding me? Is somebody making a fool of all of us? Look, if the rest of Guyana wants to be fooled, to be scorned, to be dismissed, that's all right. But not me. A united Guyana? This is not a concept, this is not a buzzword. This is something profound, unity. After Mr. Jagdev's antics, and they're not antics, after his strategy and the party strategy, talking about militarization, the chronicle, and friendly, and newspapers friendly, media friendly to the regime, have gone and further exacerbated our racial divisions, which are very real. You wanna talk about unity now? On May 12th, or after election, do we just fold tents on everybody's? A lot of damage has been done here, sir. And you think that damage is irreparable? I think it'll take a long time, beyond our time, my time, to repair it. Repar irreparable is, is pretty close. You cannot talk about militarization and then expect thousands of people who formed that block, retired and active, to suddenly say, let's all unify. We're all one. Uh, what's it? I mean, is this a fairy tale or what? Is this a, a nice thing to say? Is this something that must, must be said for the record? A unified country to reach new heights in peace and harmony. You gotta work at these things, Mr. Ram. Oh, and you are gonna meet failure and resistance from your own people and from the other side. But you've got to work on it, and you've got to exhibit great care and patience and steadfastness to get to that unity which has been so elusive to this society. How important is credibility to a manifesto and, and to the average voter deciding between party X or party Y or party Z? All right, let me, let me take a step back. If I had come from Mars and I saw these manifestos, particularly the very glossy one from the ruling party, I would have said, 
this country is on the way. But happening to, happening to be Guyanese, happening to be involved in the political conversations, I must say I know a little more than the man from Mars, maybe much more. So therefore, the, the whole thing is about credibility, trust, delivery. What has the party delivered on previous manifestos? What has the party promised and then turned its back on us? And so now it retreads the, wheel, the tires and says, look how beautiful we are. These are the things we're going to do because we love you. I mean, can the common man really believe this? I say no. The regular, ordinary man in the street should have some difficulty and believe that, look, look, I might be stupid, but I ain't dumb. I ain't that dumb that you bring this manifesto now, this icing cake, and tell me, you know what? You can get a piece of it if you allow me to go back. What happened to the past 20 years? What happened to the past 10 years? What happened to all these years that have been wasted? All this paper. We don't need the Chinese to come and carry the, the tree. We could cut them down for all this paper we're using. We need the timber for the paper. These elections would appear to be a clear choice between the PPP, which is the incumbent that has been in power for 23 years, and the coalition, which is trying to unseat the incumbent. Do you share that view? that it's just a straight choice? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. If you were to check the two in terms of competen competence, where would you... Now, you don't have a benchmark to use for the coalition. Very few of these people, except maybe Moses Nagamoto, who is now the prime ministerial candidate for the coalition, has any governmental experience. How does a voter determine, on the basis of competence, of course that's not the only factor, on the basis of competence, which party deserves my vote? Well, listen, we've got people who have had 23 years, 20 years, 15 years, 5 years of experience the incumbents in one portfolio or another. What have they done with that confidence? They've taken that confidence and turned us and this society on its head for their own benefit, for their own good, to our detriment. And the, and the list goes on. We do not want to have a litany or a continuum of what went wrong. But that competence has not been for the benefit of the society if such competence existed. On paper, you have some highly credentialed men in, in the incumbent party. On the other side, you have highly qualified men who may have lacked governmental experience because of the fact they were in the opposition. But I'm saying it is more than competence. If men, I, I am saying that the thing boils down to trust and credibility. Um, Look, I have no governmental experience. I could run this government better than what these guys are doing. I can run this government better than this, these fellows are doing. Of course, um, some people would say, well, look, you don't understand fully the problems until you get into it. Well, 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 I mean, everybody tells you you don't understand and you don't know politics and you don't know this. Look, if Mr. Ramutar can be president and he understands it, then I suppose I can do a hell of a better job than that. So, in terms of integrity... Um, excuse me, and I ain't running for nothing, right? Let me make this clear. <laughs> Tell the voters that. <laughs> <laughs> integrity. Um, if you were to look, matching up the integrity of the incumbents and that of the challenges, I understand the word is being used. Look, just for us to be clear, to be balanced, to be reasonable, 
That's the word I like, reasonable. The challenges have some questionable characters in there, from my perspective. They have some questionable people in there. But when measured against the incumbents, the, channel, the challenges look like a, a far better choir. They look like choir boys. Oh, let me go back. Let me, let me go back. I had just left. I had just left this country. Burnham was in power. I knew some of the things, and I was part of some of the things, but I, I left very, very early. And they said Burnham did this, and Burnham did that. And Burnham was a smart man, and a very bright fellow. But these chaps make you look stupid. The in people, in, not in terms of brightness, but in terms of deviousness, they have made him look stupid. So if the question is about integrity, the incumbent party has got the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel. Lack of it. Lack of it, sir. Any question you have asked in your capacity as an accountant, as an auditor, as a commentator, you ever get an answer? You ever get a straight answer? You ever get a piece of paper that said this is what NICEL is about? Not even when you ask questions um, using your legal letterhead do you get a response. Um, so we, we will spend the next few minutes um, on the contents of the manifesto. But if you were to take characteristics as opposed to the contents, characteristics of qualification, competence, credibility, integrity, um, patriotism, they, who is in it? What, what are you in it for? Are you in it to make a billion and get out? Um, where would your vote go using these characters? And do you think these are reasonable characteristics by which to judge people seeking governmental office? Yes, sir. Competence, integrity, trust, believability, which is another word for credibility, patriotism, definitely. That's what in it for me, but what I can give, how I can serve. As a Christian, how we can wash feet. That might be asking too much of the politicians. But based on those, those characteristics, let me say to the viewers and to you, Mr. Ram, I have never voted in my life. A resident of Boston, a resident of New York, U.S. citizen, never voted in my life. At, I, at, any, at any level? Never, never voted at any state, level, at any state place. Federal. State, federal, city, nothing. Never. Never voted in this country. Why is that? Uh, do, you, do you feel that people have a, a duty to vote? Yes, yes. Let me say this. A lot of good men have made the ultimate sacrifice for me and people like me to, to exercise that franchise. So therefore, there was that obligation. I regret that. I regret that. Are you going to fix it? Well, for the first... For the, for the future? For the first time in my life, I am preparing to vote. I have gone so far, I have my ID card. Your name is Analyst? Yes, sir. You and know where you're voting, I, where your polling station is? I called up and say, where I registered here, where do I go? So I know where I have to vote. And that's what you think every voter ought to be doing? That's what every voter ought to be doing. And so let me emphasize, I plan, God willing, to be voting on Monday the 11th, for the first time ever. And my vote will be based on trust. Trust. I believe in the future. I have to hope in the decency that I've seen exhibited so far by the challenges. Get, it's not absolute, it's not perfect, but com compared or relative to the other side, it has spoken well to me. Look, um a vote is a personal thing. It's not. Ne it's it's private in terms of the polling booth. But there's nothing wrong with someone saying, "I will vote for candidate X or list X or candidate Y or list Y." Is that something you're prepared to say on this program tonight? Yes, sir. I, I thought for a moment after I saw Alvin Kali Churan uh, being very public in his endorsement. I said maybe I should do something like that too, because to, to really articulate my commitment, my intention to go to this step, which I've never done before. So yes, on this program, I'm prepared to say that I, 
GHK Lal, re migrant, citizen, volunteer, servant. I'm prepared to vote. I'm ready to vote for the challenges for the opposition. And you're revoting for the coalition? Yes, sir. Now, let's turn to some of the contents. And I know we only agreed this program today. Um, and I will try to guide you as much as I can. Thank you. Um, I've selected a number of areas, crime and security, governance, health, education, sugar corruption, Amerindian affairs, tax reform. I wonder if you could tell me how the two contenders stack up in terms of these two, in, in terms of these major areas addressed in their manifesto. Let's start with crime and security. Okay. And maybe you could use the the incumbent. Obviously, has a, to be judged on his track record as well. Mm -hmm. uh, um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's the reality. It's it's been there for twenty three years. How has it performed on crime and security, and how is it going to change what it has been doing for the past twenty three years? Well. Crime and security, I think, is a misnomer because crime and insecurity is what has plagued this society. It has not gotten better. It has gotten worse. It has gotten worse in terms of from the under the under the PPP, guns and the gun trade has flourished. Have flourished. This is a feeder. This is a this is a feeder for crime. This is a feeder for violence. This is a feeder for insecurity. This is a feeder for in co for corruption, which has contaminated the security forces and which has put all of us at risk. So, from that perspective, oh sure, the words are there. We'll do this and we'll do that. We'll reinforce the security forces, we'll give them the, the tools and the resources. And we'll have a security sector strategic plan according to the... There's always a plan. The Russians always had a five-year plan. The Russians are still the Russians. I mean, they still have five-year plans and that have never been fulfilled. So yes, you had drug master plans and you've got five strategic plans. They, they sound nice. They're well written. But the thing like manifestos and like constitutions, Mr. Ram, is that unless there's the will to implement these things on the ground and to implement them consistently and not arbitrarily or conveniently, then we are lost. So we could talk about crime and security till the cows come home or whatever else comes home, and we'll still be in the same place, which is not a good place. On the question, let's move on. So you would, your tick, and we, 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 you don't have several votes, you have one vote in terms of national election, but I mean, you, you favor the coalition's manifestos, plans over the government. Right. The, what, the little detail that can be shared in the manifesto, the, high, the, high, the executive summary level points, yes, I share that. On the question of governance, the, um, the incumbent talks about ensuring accountability, transparency, and fairness in the public sector. Are, are you going to stop or are you going to continue? Transparency and accountability. Those words have been kicked about so terribly, so constantly. Uh, I mean, they've lost meaning. Do they have any meaning for the ruling party? Transparency and accountability. The information SAR has no information to share. There are no documents to give us a paper trail where tens of millions of dollars, if not more, has been spent over the, over the years. What are you going to talk about transparency and accountability now? What has happened in the past decade, the past 15 years? Where has the transparency? It can't be according to your definition. It can't be according to when you feel, OK, here's a bone, keep quiet. So you're going to tell me that transparency and accountability come June 2015, it has no traction, sir. It has no merit. 
It has no acceptability. So you don't have any high regard I have for this commitment by the PPPC to publish a cabinet code of conduct? Who's going to observe? Of course they'll publish a cabinet code of conduct. I could write it for them right now, which will not be far from... But who is... It's going to be observing the bridge. Like everything else. This, the, the incumbent's manifesto does not deal with the issue, and I want to be very fair to them, on the question of constitutional reform. I don't think I saw that. 20, what was it? 23 years after the PPP came into power, I hear some people still talking about the Bornum Constitution. 23 years later, sir, how this thing is still the Bornum Constitution? I know he was the architect and the author and all this business. But after 23 years in power, and I think Mr. Lai, formerly of Beacon Foundation, etc., wrote something about <laughs> not wanting to go there, the ruling party, not want, it's not the highest of priority. So unsurprisingly, there is no place for constitutional reform or an interest in what is meant by, to be involved in constitutional reform, which this country sorely needs in that manifesto. They ain't touch anything. And on the other hand, um, the, if the opposition has said within the first hundred days, we are going to form a group I think it's a committee they call it. Who's going to look into this to see how we pro how we proceed? And they they in fact speak of constitutional, judicial, electoral, and parliamentary reform. Uh, Practically all the arms uh, of the same. Yes, sir. So I think I think look. That's a meaty, necessary, vital, crucial start. That's saying look, we're serious. The proof will be in the pudding. I mentioned to you before we, we, we came in here for the actual uh, taping that I plan, depends on how things developing, not to say anything for the first hundred days. I'd like to really like to see this happen because this will tell me good faith, good intentions, I, I, implementation. And your faith as well. Yes, sir. Yes. Health. The, the, again, the, the, the two, the, on page 33, it, it's very interesting, the, one of the first things the, page 33 says on the question of health, is completing the specialty hospital. The coalition talks about setting public health as a, as a precondition for good care. Which, which of those concepts, because it seems to be a conceptual, a different differences in concept now? Mm -hmm. I favor the coalition's approach. Uh, and I think that the health sector, as much as Michael Kahn and I are, are pretty close friends, uh, I feel that the health sector, having made some strides, having a lot of resources plugged into it, needs to be far ahead of where it is right now. Uh, and, I and, and one is not holding Michael Kahn because he's just a this public hospital corporation yes. of Georgetown. Well, I, in the interest of this, I had to say that. Yes, I, I, yes. I felt but I, his role is limited in the yes, health sector. Yes, yes. But I, I'm saying that I, I prefer, with the limited look I've had at this, I prefer the opposite, the challenger's approach to the health, to, to addressing our health care needs. Education. The, 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 what stands out in terms of the education plan, and I teach at the University of Guyana, I, I guess that um, has some effect on me, is to make the University of Guyana a world-class institution. That's the, that's the apex of our education system uh, you know i thought i was the word smith around here right i thought i was the man with the pen who could do all these weave this magic and whatever people say world class i would really love to see that mr ram that would really really be something that we could stick our chest out and say well done 
But look at where we are right now. We've got we've got a long time and a long process, arduous, costly, to get there. Look, talk is cheap. These guys have been talking forever. World class, I'd like that. But it comes back again to what have you been doing all the time? What have you done for us lately in the field of education, in the field of this institution where you are dominant and where you call all the shots? Isn't this a contrast? Whilst the, um, the PPPC talks about establishing world-class standards at the University of Ghana, the coalition speaks of rescuing the University of Ghana. Because, the, and I think that goes to my point, that the thing is in such deplorable state that it needs to be salvaged. It needs to be hauled out of where it's fallen into and then put on level ground and then talk about, look, let's leverage this thing. And look, we, look, we could keep fooling ourselves or we could be realistic and we have to be blunt with ourselves. We gotta try some chemotherapy here. We got born out the bad cells. We got to stop this thing of propagandizing you. World class university, yes sir, all that we want it. You just don't have my writing, uh, you know, a line on a manifesto. Where's the intention? Where's the willpower? Where's the commitment? Sugar. The coalition on sugar speaks of commissioning a commission of inquiry into the operations of Gaisuko, appointing an expert team to investigate and remedy the problems facing Gaisuko and Skeleton Factory, appointing competent and representative boards of directors. The other guy said, what, $20 billion? The other, <laughs> the other party says, we will put a minimum of $20 billion. Well, that's, what does money do to fixing a problem? Uh, look, look, let me talk this thing in common sense terms. They got a time when you got to cut your losses. They got, they got a time. They got a time when you got to stop throwing good money after bad. I think the time has reached us where I like because of so many families so many communities involved that I like, instead of $20 billion, let's stop. Let, hold on, hold on. Let's stop here and take a gut check. Where are we going? What are we doing? Is it working? Can it work? And I think that's what I hear the opposition saying, the challenge saying, let me examine this thing. Let's take a real close, hard, honest look at it and see what the results are. And then we will decide where we go from there. The issue of Amerindians, again, the PPP has held Amerindians very close to their heart, the Amerindian Development Fund, uh, the Amerindian Act. Um, where, how do you compare the two? Quite frankly, I don't think I'm well equipped to speak sure. intelligently on this here. I feel that the, our indigenous people have been exploited have been exploited very terribly, and that's a tragedy in and of itself. And I feel that the incumbent party, the incumbent government, has not done justice for these people. Again, I feel it, it goes to a new start and a new beginning, and we will see where the challenges can take us. You will move on from the, the operative signaling. We have just about two and a half minutes more. You have written about this issue of corruption. The manifestos approach the issues very differently. The manifesto of the challengers feel that those who have committed crime must pay. Misuse of state resources, ignoring the laws, ignoring the constitution. Is not which hunt, and now how do we get forgiveness? How do we bring peace and stability to our country? 
if we pursue this line? I, I think you have to. You, you, you don't just... Cleaning house might be the wrong way to go about it, but you have to get the most egregious examples and make examples of them. So as to send a message not only to the society that this is not a boys club, this is not a political club, but that we are serious and we are sending a message to our own people in our ranks that look, this is a new day. That we talk about corruption and anti-corruption and we are serious about it. So to do nothing would have the man in the street say, all the man is the same. Something has to be done. Something must be done, Mr. Ram, because of the volume and the cost and the disgust that the chronic runaway corruption has introduced in this country. I, I know you're close to some of the people in Transparency Institute. Um, what, in your estimation, is the extent of corruption? in this country. Clive Thomas said that the underground economy is somewhere many I think he said about 60%. 60%. But all of that is not necessarily corruption. It's Ill unlawful, illegal. But they're linked. You can't separate them from one another. Uh, there might be different children, but they're the same father. There might be different mothers, but they're the same father. I, I say that corruption is real bad in this society and it is killing us. How important, um, this is my final question, I get signals from the operator, how important are these elec elections to this country? It is and why people must vote, perhaps along the lines you are suggesting? This, this election is a make or break it, it's the crossroads for this country. We have come to a road. It's a road that we don't like. We have got to decide, not only that the road is there, that we have to travel it, and how we are going to travel it. This is how we, important this election is for us. Mr. G. H. Hilal, I want to thank you very much for appearing at rather short notice on Plain Talk election special. And I wish you all the best as you proceed to the polls in, on Monday. My privilege, sir. Thank you. Operator, thank you very much for facilitating me once again. Uh, Viewers, you've heard Mr. G. H. K. Lal, one of our outstanding citizens, analyze the manifestos of the two parties and come to his conclusion. My appeal to you would be that you carry out a similar exercise and that you perform your civic duty. Of course, you have a duty. You have a right not to vote as well, but you perform a civic duty if we think we have, we can play and direct the direction in which, or influence the direction in which this country, country should go, then I think it's incumbent on all of us that we go out there and vote on Monday, May 11. I want to say again, thank you viewers, good night, and I'll see you one week from now.